know, we're talking a lot about heaven in this series, being that the, it's called Here Comes Heaven. And I guess this morning I woke up with this chorus on my heart, just couldn't get it off my mind. And if you know this chorus, why don't you sing it with us? I know it's an older one, but I just love the focus of it. I love where it leads us when it comes to God. And, uh, you know, Moses said these words. He said, you know what, Lord? I don't care if the land is flowing with milk and honey. If your presence is not there, I don't want to go. I'd rather live here in the desert for endless years if this is where you're going to be, if this is where I can find you. And because as you know, as we talked about last Sunday, that without God, the gold will grow, will fade, the silver will tarnish, the diamonds will lose their luster. It really is about the presence of God. Amen? It's about being where he's at. And so if you know this chorus, go ahead and sing it with us this morning. And just let's worship for a moment. Lord, you and stand with us as we sing it. If you want to raise your hands, do, do what feels natural. Lord, you are more precious than silver. And Lord, you are more costly than sing it through one more time. Lord, you are. Just sing it out to him. Lord, you are more precious than silver. And Lord, you sing it again. Let's sing it through. Lord, you are. Sing it again. Lift your voices. Lord, you are more precious than silver. And Lord, you are more costly than Lord, 
nothing we desire and nothing I desire compares with you. Let's give him praise. Let's worship him today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I tell you what, it just couldn't get it out of my heart today and and just the simplicity of knowing him. Amen? It's not complicated. We make it so complicated. We think it's all about the riches, all about the wealth, all about the glitz, all about the whatever. But in reality, it all comes down to knowing him. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. As we get into our word today, I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 10 or chapter 6, verse 10. A familiar chapter as it is the Lord's Prayer. The disciples came and said, Lord, of all the things that he was doing, signs, wonders, miracles, of all the things he was doing, the one thing they asked him to teach them was this, how to pray, how to approach God, how to worship In fact, it was in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus would introduce God, Jehovah, Yahweh, as Father. They had never heard that concept before. They had never known him as Father. And, of course, he would say the famous words, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then you get to verse 10, the scripture for today. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Can you say that verse with me? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so today, I would give the the title of today's word is Heaven Lives at Home. Heaven Lives at Home. Talking about how that we need to have heaven's culture in our home. Every one of us, every one of our homes today, if I were to walk into your house, it would take a little, it might take a few minutes, it might take a couple hours, but I would begin to learn the culture of your home, of your family, of what is, what's considered acceptable, unacceptable, filtered, unfiltered, what's considered um, the norm in your house, as it would be in my house. You know, if you walk into any house, you'll get a sense of whether it's a war zone in this house or whether it's truly a house where heaven lives. Amen? And then you got everything in between. And, of course, there's no perfect house. We know that. But it's our desire as believers that heaven lives in our house, that heaven's culture is in our house. And if it's not in heaven, that it shouldn't be in our house. Amen? I mean, if that's heaven's culture, and so it comes with atmosphere, it comes with presence. In fact, when Jesus was um, giving this word, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he was literally saying, he said this to the disciples, he was literally telling them, make this decree, make this declaration, and say it this way, kingdom of God Come, heaven, come, be in my house as it is in heaven. I want your atmosphere, I want your presence, I want your, I want your, pre, your, your, your word that's alive, I want, your, I want the Holy Spirit to have freedom in my house. And so, I'm t- and so there are times in your life you may say, God, your will be done Kingdom come in my marriage. Kingdom come in my family. Kingdom come in my literal house. Kingdom come in my workplace. Kingdom come in my relationships. It's a decree. It's a, you know, the Bible says life and death are in the tongue. You can either curse your house or you can bless your house. You can either say, your kingdom come in my house as it is in heaven. Amen? And that's what he was telling the disciples that they were to do. Wherever they went, they were to call down heaven. They were to make known heaven. And so when it comes to heaven living in your home, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share a kind of a progressive thought with you on what that looks like, what that, what that um, uh, how it's manifest, how it looks. And so heaven living in your home, number one, looks like salvation. That's the first sign of heaven, that people have confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Matthew 3, 1, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness in Judah, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does repent mean? It means you're going one direction and you're making an about face. You're turning away from the world and you're turning toward heaven. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who was he talking about? He was prophesying about the Messiah. He was saying, turn around because the Messiah is coming. Heaven is coming. Salvation is coming. The kingdom of heaven is coming. He was saying, in essence, here comes heaven. Say to your neighbor, heaven is coming. Here comes heaven. Look for it. Turn around. Get your face off the world. Get your gaze off of the things of this world and look to Jesus. Amen? He even said it among, he said, even Jesus said of John the Baptist, he says in, in, in Matthew eleven twelve. 12, he says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I'm going to read another translation that may, you may get a better understanding of what that means. Another translation says this way. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. Isn't that profound? Since the moment John the Baptist came out of the wilderness and began to preach heaven, the kingdom has been bursting forth and passionate people are taking hold of its power. Think about yourself. Number one, you, you become a born-again believer. At that moment, you have heaven living in your heart. At that moment, every step you take, you're bringing heaven with you. Amen? At that moment, heaven is suffering violence, and the violent is taking it by force. What does that mean? That heaven, everywhere you go, heaven is bursting forth, and people who are looking for salvation are grabbing a hold of it. Amen? People who are hungry, people who are yearning for more, of, for, for, for what the meaning of life is and for eternal life, salvation. So number one, heaven in your home looks like salvation. You know, we think about Thanksgiving right now, and we're, you know, we're heading into Thanksgiving week, and, and with that, we're making all kinds of plans, and of course, our house probably has no less than 30 people every time we have Thanksgiving, and however many tables we can squeeze around the corner, you know, Sherry's already asking me, she's like, can we set one up in both family rooms, and, and at the main table, and, and everywhere else, and in the hallways, and everything, and so we always have a lot of people, and one of the things that, that you think of at Thanksgiving is, is everyone I know know Jesus? Are they having an encounter with Jesus? Am I, am I, when I step into the room, are they seeing heaven? When they come to my house, if you're, how many people are hosting Thanksgiving this year? Really? That's all? How many are hosting Thanksgiving? That means it's at your house. Okay, there we go. And so, uh, by the way, Think ahead next year, the Hate family, if you ever want to invite us, we're always the host. You could be our host next time, you know, and uh, I'm just putting out the word. But, um, but when you think about it, you're going to have people at your house. You know, it, it tends to be a family reunion, right? It tends to be a time when family, both saved and non-believers, are there. And, and when they walk into your house this week, and not just this week, but in your home, I, I appreciate this about my wife all these years, with our, especially with our kids, is that as busy as life has gotten over the years, it's been her determination to say, we've got to have at least three or, three or more nights, if we can help it, a week where we sit down as a family around the table. Amen? You know, back when I was a kid, when, what was it called? The, was it called? The, those TV dinners came out, and people started just 
microwaving them and then going to the living room and plopping in front of the television and eating their individual meals. You know, mine was the Salisbury steak and corn. That was my favorite, right? And I had to have two of them. One was never enough. And, uh, but, but, but when it comes to the culture, you're, you know, when you sit at the table, you are, in essence, setting a culture in your home. It's not just at the table, but it's, it's what, like I said, what you allow and don't allow, what you expect and don't expect, what, what, what is the atmosphere of your home. Because as a born-again believer, you are given immediately access to heaven. As believers, we're giving access to heaven. Matthew 3 says it there again. Talking about John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, the word says when he, was, when he, bapt, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. When you are born again, you are automatically given access to heaven. And not just that, but immediately God declares you. Before Jesus performed one miracle, before he raised one dead, before he opened up one blind eye, before he opened up one deaf ear, before he showed kindness to anybody, God already affirmed who he was. He says, this is my boy. This is my son. I'm, I, I approve of him. I'm proud of him. And the moment you come into the kingdom of God, you've been given full access into the heavenlies or into the kingdom, and immediately God says, you're my daughter, you're my son. Amen? Heaven is our identity at that moment. The Bible says that we live in the world, but we're no longer of this world. We no longer identify as the world, but rather, rather we identify with heaven. And again, like I said, if it's not in heaven, then we don't want it. Amen? Because our lives are, you know, I read it this last week. I think it was Philippians who said that we are now citizens of heaven. And we've been given access as well as we have the power of heaven behind us. And so Jesus having access, Jesus having the approval of God the Father, he could not give what he did not have. We cannot give what we do not have. Amen? The thing about Jesus, though, he was altogether God, altogether man, and we, we could say, well, he did it in the authority as God. But instead, Jesus submitted himself to God the Holy Spirit as an example for us that everything he did, we are to do also. He says, I, he says you're going to do these things multiplied times over, over and over again. Everything you've seen me do, you can do as well. Amen? And so we cannot give what we do not have. And so if we don't have heaven, we can't offer, we can't offer heaven. We, all we have to offer is hell, a hellish life, hopelessness, despair. And so we have the access. We have the authority behind us. We can demonstrate heaven in our homes. Amen? It is now our identity. And then we have a message the word says in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What was he saying? Here comes heaven. Everywhere you go, to the gas station, to the bank, to the grocery store, to, to your, even coming out of your home, everywhere you go, heaven is right there. Do you realize that in essence as a believer, all heaven stands at attention to the believer who will declare heaven on earth. When you say heaven come, heaven takes notice. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but even all the angels of heaven, they come to attention. They, there, there are probably more unemployed angels now than there ever has been. They're waiting for someone to call on heaven. They're waiting for someone to declare healing over sickness. Freedom over addiction, healing over unforgiveness, reconciliation. They're just waiting for the chance for someone to say, heaven of God, come in Jesus' name. Amen? And so this is our message. 
and we're to do it boldly. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm talking about doing it boldly, sincerely. The word even says, speak the truth in love. Share it in love. In Mark 16, 20, uh, which was basically the end of, you know, Mark, when, if you read the book of Mark, it's always kind of headliners. He's able, he abbreviates all of these things in the life of Jesus. Matthew, Luke, and John expand on all these things. But in, the, in Mark 16, 20, Jesus is, is basically saying, go with all boldness. You have all of heaven behind you. Amen? In Acts 4.29, you remember the story where Peter and John, the day before, they had, they, had, they had prayed over this lame man who had not walked since birth. And, and they even told the people. The people wanted to come and worship them. And they said, we're not gods, but rather we come in the name of Jesus. And the word says the religious leaders took, got, took note of it, and they took him. They beat them. They threw him into prison. And the next day they said, do not speak the name of Jesus ever again. And what did Peter do? Did he go home and lick his sores? Did he go home and have a pity party? Instead, he went to his house party, and he said to the people, we need to pray for more boldness. We need to pray that God would move in a greater way. And the Bible says, he said, Lord, extend your hand for healing and give us more boldness. And the Bible says that the house began to shake as the presence of God moved, as heaven moved in that place. Amen? We need to pray that, you know, you have little earthquakes in your house because you're having prayer time. You're making declarations. The heavenlies are suffering violence and the violent are taking it by force. Amen? The violent are saying, heaven come. Jesus come. This is not acceptable in my house. The world is no longer acceptable to me. It no longer entices me. It no longer uh, woos me. But rather, I need your boldness to declare it. The word says in Mark 5, 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, heaven in your home is not just you being saved, not just you being bold and not just having a message and not just being a witness but the fact, well, let me say it this way, that you're being a witness, that you're not hiding it. You know, you don't cover up the Bible when people come into your house. You don't, you don't talk about, uh, this is the thing I love about the body of Christ. When, 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 you, when heaven is on earth, every conversation leads to Jesus. You know? I mean, I, know, I understand it. If you love classic cars, you'd want to talk about classic cars. I get it. If you love cooking, you're always talking about your favorite recipe. I love eating. I just don't know the recipe to it. And so I always tell Sherry, hey, can you make this? That looks good, you know. And so there's certain things you, you, you tend to talk about. But ultimately, the best, the best thing is when you begin to talk about Jesus. All of a sudden, it's like the room is electrified. All of a sudden, you sense this presence of God, this atmosphere of heaven as you begin to profess declare, give a testimony to who God is. Amen? And so we are to be a witness. And then, he's, and then to have heaven in your home, you're to walk in, a, in, in that authority of it. Luke 10, 8 says it this way. This was when Jesus was commissioning the 70 to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, deliver people from incurable diseases. He says, whatever city you enter and they receive you, Eat such things that are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Isn't it interesting that he says, whenever you sit down to someone's table, bring heaven to the table. If there's someone sick at the table, pray for them. If there's someone oppressed, possessed, discouraged, Pray for them. If there's some, have you ever had a family member that that so in love with Jesus that you know it was dangerous to ask them to pray for the dinner, because you'd say, "Hey, Aunt Jenny, can you pray for dinner tonight?" And about 15 minutes later, you're still praying. There's no steam coming off the food now, and the little Johnny's over there saying, "Mom," and they're just eating under their under their table covers, trying to slip a spoon of food in their mouth, because Miss Jenny, she is bringing heaven into that home. Amen? Amen? 
That's what, that's what it's all about. God says, I want you to bring heaven to your table. Even here, he says, it's something as simple as eating around the dinner table. When you're doing that, heal the sick. Raise the dead. If someone chokes on their food this Thanksgiving, raise them up again. You know, do the Heimlich first, see if that works. And if they die, then you've got the power to raise them. Amen? Don't just, don't just say, what are we going to do? Call down heaven. Heaven come. Amen? Praise God. Anytime you sit at the table, bring the presence of heaven with you. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I like this other version. I wrote the word wow next to it because it just hit me. It says in another version, If imperfect parents know how lovingly to take care of their children and give them what they need, how much more will the perfect heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit's fullness when his children ask him. We need the Holy Spirit at our tables. We need him. He is the manifested, tangible evidence of God's presence, evidence of heaven on earth. Amen? He is the evidence of it. I love how it says that. And so we need, we need him. And he simply says this, ask me, ask me and I will be there, ask me and I will move, ask me and I will bring life and encouragement. I love this verse. I just went through, what I did was I typed in the word heaven and I just started scrolling through all the verses of heaven and all this stuff just started popping out. All these things about heaven, how heaven is to be brought into earth. Matthew 6, 18 and I also say to you that you are Peter. Talk, he was talking to Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Another version says it this way. I like this. It says, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth what's been forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. God has given us the keys to the kingdom. What are the keys? The keys of death, hell, the grave, sickness, disease, addiction, possession, oppression, anything that, anything that is contrary to the nature and the knowledge of God, he's given you the keys to it. And he's saying, I, I've given you those keys for a reason. Now use it. Unlock what God has for that situation. How many people have keys in your pockets? Take them out. I want to hear some rattling of keys. Those keys represent the kingdom. Death, hell, the grave, addiction, abuse, verbal, physical Anything you can think of, abandonment, unforgiveness. God says, I've given you a key to everything to unlock heaven on earth. Amen? Amen. To unlock heaven on earth. So, all, again, all, not only does all of heaven stand at attention, but God says, I've given you everything you need to bring heaven to earth. Amen? Amen? We, you know, again, this is talking about the presence of God. Even at our house parties, we, you know, the first thing that we do is what? We recognize the presence of God. There's four components, presence of God, testimonies, communion, and prayer. And, we, and the first thing we do is say, Lord, we acknowledge your presence here. If your presence is not here, we might as well go home. We might as well call it a night. Uh, you know, I think sometimes people treat God, say, well, I'll, I'll show up unless I find something else better to do. But if the presence of God is there, you better believe people are showing up. You better believe they're saying, I need what God has. I need deliverance. I need salvation. I need healing. I need freedom in Jesus' name. Amen? And so Galatians 5.22 says it this way, talking about our authority there is fruit and there are gifts. The word says the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
And then it goes on to say joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against of which there is no law. Re- look at the word there. It's singular. It didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It said the fruit of the Spirit is love. Every other, every other word, every other adjective is a description or an outflow of the love of God. It brings joy. It brings peace. It brings long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I remember it was, it was some years ago when, and I've told this story before, but I just feel like it's appropriate for what I'm saying right now. It was several years ago that, maybe about six, seven years ago when I was getting ready for work one day, and uh, in the process of it, I opened up Facebook, and I scrolled a little bit for a minute or two, and then I happened to come across one of people who go to church here, and they had posted this phrase out of 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. And I'm like, and of course, as every good believer, you got to like it or else you get judged by God for not liking his word, you know? And so I liked it and I kind of moved on. Ten minutes later, I'm still getting ready um, for the day. And as I was getting ready, I remember I was pulling out a drawer pulling for something else, looking for something else. And I remember the Holy Spirit just loudly in my heart and mind said, Terry, love is patient. And in that moment, it was like I got a download. It wasn't just the phrase, love is patient. All of a sudden, I realized what God is really saying to me in that passage, and I believe it's so true. We can be patient when we know what the outcome is going to be. When it's a guaranteed outcome... It's kind of like guys, we like to watch games, right, football, baseball, whatever. And, you, and, and, and maybe you've pre-recorded a game and you already know what the score is of your team and you know your team has won. And so when you go to watch the recording, do you get upset when they throw an interception or a fumble? Do you get upset when they miss a strike? Do you, you know, no, because you know your team won the game. And so you can sit back and be patient, You can sit back and enjoy. You can sit back and just love the game. Amen? And the same is true even in our relationships with one another. Is that when we know the outcome, we can demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Love. And all these other things will take care of themselves. Amen? And then there is the, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but then there are the gifts of the Spirit. The word says in 1 Corinthians 12, 6 and 7, the same God distributes different kinds of miracles that accomplish different results through uh, through each believer's gift and ministry as he energizes and activates them. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just himself, but all. I say that all to say this is that Spiritual fruit and gifts confirm the word and expand the kingdom of God. When you're operating in the fruit of the Spirit, that's the thing, though. you got to make sure your fruit isn't rotten. You could be dripping with gifts, words of knowledge, prophecy, faith, healing, all of that. But if your fruit, but if you walk in the room and someone says, wow, something stinks in here. If you ever walked into your house and maybe something got left in the garbage too long and now the odor is just kind of pilfered through the house after it's been shut up all day. And you're hunting through the house. Where is that rotten banana? Where is that fruit? Where, what's going on here? That's the same true for us as believers. We need to say, God, I want to operate in love. You know? Uh, I want because in the end I know what the outcome is. And I can be patient. And I can be long-suffering. And I can be kind. And I can... And I can do a lot of things when I know that you are in control. Can you say yes to that? In Mark 16, 19 through 20, the word says, and, and this is Jesus commissioning the disciples. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs and wonders, amen. And so when we manifest heaven through fruits of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, what better place than around the table? 
What better place than your home? You know, we, we, you know, this authority that God has given us, you know, there's been countless nights where I've roamed the hallways of my house over the years. I'm kind of a light sleeper anyhow, but I've, I've gotten up at times and just roamed the house over the years, you know, up and down the, the, the hallways and through the kitchen and the living and dining and, and just praying, declaring heaven come to my house. Your kingdom come now. As in heaven, so in my house. As in heaven, so in my family. I remember a couple years ago, I didn't learn this until maybe like three or four years ago, but my two oldest sons, Clayton and Nathan, um, when they were about 12 or 13, uh, they're a year and a half, 18 months apart, and they didn't know this about each other until some years later. I think they were out of high school when they were, ta- when they were talking and they shared a story about themselves. Both of them were having, at a certain time in our life, both of them were having dreams, and they had the same exact dream. And the dream was this. They said, in this dream, I could see demons clamoring at the windows of our house but could not come in. And they only shared this with each other a few years ago. And when they told me that, I'm like thinking to myself, what was going on at that time? But not only that, but so many times I think to myself, God, I declare your heaven, I declare heaven in my home. That nothing of the world, no demonic uh, force or no uh, enemy of the believer is allowed to have dominance in this place. Why? He's given us authority. Amen. Amen. He's given us authority over our homes. He's given us authority around the table. Moms and dads, he's given authority with you and your family. Husband and wives, he's given you, given you authority in your marriage. You know, you heard me say this a few weeks ago. We are not physical pe- beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. We are more spirit than we are flesh. Yeah, I get it. That's what we see. But there's something happening in the spirit that's even greater. That is what determines salvation. That's what determines deliverance. That's what determines freedom. That's what determines, the Bible says the, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty. You know what I'm saying? You could look good on the outside, but all be all in bondage and imprisoned on the inside, right? But God has given us authority. He's given us the keys to the kingdom, I said this in the first service. I'll try it out again. <laughs> but in all reality, when you love, what you, and this is literally what's happening, when you're loving them, you're loving the hell out of them. Amen? When you sit at the table this coming Thursday, Thursday morning or afternoon, think to yourself, I'm going to love the hell out of my family. I'm going to drive. The Bible says it is the love of God that drives out all fear. It's the love of God that drives out demons. The love of God that drives out addiction. The love of God that drives out brokenness and despair and hopelessness. Amen? And so when we love them, we can do it patiently. We can do it in, with, with, with heaven behind us. And so in that, we're not only drawing a line of defense for our home but we're also advancing the kingdom of God. It's not just, we're not, you know, mo, you know, you talk about the armor of God, the helmet, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the, 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 our feet are, cover, feet are covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All of that is really, most of that is really offensive armament. The sword in particular. All of it, some of it's defensive, but in reality, in fact, if you looked at a Roman soldier, there was no armament on the back. We don't have to worry about who our rear guard is. It's Jesus. Amen? He just says, I want you to go forward with all boldness. I've got your back. I'm here for you. Heaven is behind you. If you will just declare it, kingdom of God, come and drive out the enemy, the enemies in your life. Amen? And not just that, but we have his protection. I just said it. Paul told Timothy these words. He says, in the Lord, in in 2 Timothy 4, 17, 
He says, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. God is, 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 is overshadowing you. Heaven is overshadowing you. He's looking for someone. The word says that the Lord is looking to and fro in the earth to see if he can find people of faith. People that would be bold. People that would declare heaven on earth. Heaven, can we say it this way? Heaven in, heaven in Hermiston as it is in heaven. We need to declare in our home, in our workplace. We need to declare it in our city at large. God, your will be done in, on, in Hermiston as it is in heaven. Amen? And so he says, I promise that he will protect you from every evil, evil work and preserve you for his heavenly kingdom. Of course, there's nothing better than the fellowship that comes along with heaven. Matthew 12, 50 says, For whoever does the will of the Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. This was Jesus talking to the crowd when his mother Mary and brothers were looking for him. He said, you know what? The ones who are really my, my family are the ones who do the will of God, are the ones who take God at his word, are the ones who are, who are declaring your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in my home as it is in heaven. And then lastly, as the musicians are coming, this is your calling. You are called to this. You are commissioned for this. I caught this phrase in Hebrews. It's just a short phrase, but, it, but the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 3, verse 1, Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. We're not sure exactly who wrote Hebrews, but we do know this. He was addressing those who have been called by heaven, who share that call on their life. To do what? To bring heaven to earth. You know, I, there's coming a day where, we, where faith will end in sight. There will no longer be, per se, the need for the gifts of the Spirit and other things because we will be in heaven for all time and eternity. But in the meantime, he says, I want you to advance my kingdom in the earth. Everywhere you go, I want heaven to be manifested. I want people to have tangible evidence, representation, wherever you go, even in the words you speak, words of life. He told Timothy, Paul told Timothy one time, he said, Timothy, when you speak, may it, may it be the very breath of heaven, the very oracle of God, the very voice of God. It was said of Samuel, the prophet, whenever he would speak, that not one word would fall to the ground. That's the culture of heaven. Words are weighty. God's words never fail. And he wants our words to line up with his words. Our declaration to line up with his declaration. It's his desire to see heaven on earth. It's his desire to see heaven in your home. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning? I wrote this down. I heard a minister say this recently. He said, take the gospel of the kingdom and declare it everywhere we go. In that decree, words become spirit. And when the spirit is present, he manifests the kingdom. And when the kingdom is manifested, everyone's options have changed. All restrictions and limitations have vanished because a kingdom without limits has just become manifest. When you walk into a room and people not just see your life, but they hear the words you're speaking and they're sensing this presence of God, they, for the first time possibly, have hope for their own life. In their addictions, in their verbal abuse, in their physical abuse, in their hurts, in their pain, in their sin, they think this is as good as it gets. This is my life. This is who I am. This is what I identify with. But as a believer, a spirit-filled, passionate believer who's pulling on heaven, walks into the room with no limitations. Alcoholic, 
it is not God's will for you to be an alcoholic all your life. Drug addict, it's not his will for you to be a drug addict all your life. In fact, when he delivers you, you no longer have to say, I'm an addict. But you can say, I'm free. Amen? I know the world has conditioned us to to keep repeating the same mantra over and over again. But that is so contrary to what the Word says. It is so not heaven's culture. I don't go around saying, I'm an addict for 20 years. Or I'm in despair for 30 years. Or, you know, I'm broken for 30. I don't, we, we're not to live in the broken places. But he says, when, it, when heaven is introduced, all limitations are off. Freedom is ushered into that place. Freedom comes into the heart. Nothing is now impossible for God to do. Amen. It's like Peter said. He said, Lord, we can't save anybody. We can't heal anybody. How are we, how are we to save all these people? Of course, it wasn't, it's not man that saves. It's only God that saves. But, God, but Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, what is impossible for man, what's impossible for you is not impossible for God. But when a man or a woman of God walks in the room full of heaven, full of the Holy Spirit, with that holy boldness, all bets are off. All limitations are now lifted. All of, he- all of hell's regulations no longer apply here because Jesus has just walked into the room and who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen? Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. You need to make some, de- before Thanksgiving Day comes, you need to start making some declarations. When you walk out of this house today and you get in your car, or yeah, this house, when you get in your car, you need to begin to make declarations. You need to begin to pull on heaven, saying, Your will be done in this place as it is in heaven. I don't accept anything less than heaven in my house. I don't want to have hell for a house, I don't want to be a hell house. I want to be a place where the presence of God abides and where there are no limitations. Nothing holding us back. Where I can walk in the door and come and go and not not ashamed of the gospel. Like Paul says, because it is the power of God unto salvation. It has set me free. And when you declare freedom, others will be set free. Others will find Christ. Others will see and know that it is possible for them to be set free. Amen? And so if you're here today, I'm going to give two invitations. Number one, we would be remiss if we, if we did not invite anyone in this house that does not know Jesus, that does not know the freedom and the joy and the peace and the comfort of being forgiven and set free. And if you're here today, I want to invite you. We're going to pray a prayer with the whole congregation here today. But I want to invite you, would you raise a bold hand and say, I want heaven. As as believers, what, what, is our, what, is our, what is our motto? We're here to empty hell and fill heaven. I want to see heaven filled. You're, you're, you, God has a place for you. There's still room at the table. Amen? There's still room for you, a place set for you if you'll say yes. And if that's you here today, would you lift a bold hand and say, yes, that's me. I want heaven. I'm tired of hell. I'm tired of this life, the way, it's, the way I've been living it, knowing it, and you want to know Jesus. Is there anyone in the house today like that? We're going to celebrate with you if there is. With the angels, we're going to celebrate. Amen? Anyone here today that would say yes? Yes. Praise God. The Word says even when one says yes, all of heaven rejoices. Amen? Praise God. Anyone else here today that you would say yes? Anyone else here today? Praise God. I'm going to pray this prayer. And for those who raised your hand, and if you didn't raise your hand, but you're going to pray this with me anyhow, we want to connect with you after this time. And we have a a gift for you. And 
And we want you to, this is just the beginning of heaven on earth for you. Amen. And so pray these words with me. Father, thank you for your presence here today. I'm realizing there are no limits to your forgiveness, no limits to your ability to set me free. I acknowledge Jesus. Jesus, you are the Son of God. You've walked in my shoes. You've paid the price. You took my penalty for my sin. And I accept you now. Come into my heart. I repent. I make an about face. I turn from sin and I turn toward Jesus. I turn toward heaven. I turn toward forgiveness. Forgive me. Wash me. Make me altogether new. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God praise today. Please don't leave this room without speaking to someone with a lanyard today. We'll see a prayer team. But I want to do something different today. You can, you, you can scan the code up there as well. We really want to meet with you. We want to connect with you. This is just the beginning. This is not the end. Don't walk out of here and think, okay, I'm good now. This is just the beginnings of your living heaven on earth. Amen? But I want to do this this morning. This is going to be different. I'm going to, I want to invite everybody to join me at the front. Because the word says in Hebrews 1.3, we are partakers of the heavenly calling. And I want to commission every one of us, women, men, moms, dads, husbands, wives, children, for this, not just this Thanksgiving week, and all the busyness of it and all the opportunities that are going to be availed to you to demonstrate heaven in your home. But for even from there on, you may say, Pastor, my, my house has been like hell. It's good sometimes and, and not so good other times. But I want to draw a line and I want to say heaven come and I want to declare heaven reigns in my life and in my home. And so I want to pray a prayer of commissioning over all of us today. And so if you'll step out in the aisles. Thank you, Carlos, for already stepping in. Step out in the aisles, all of us. This is for everybody. Just come all the way to the front so others can come up behind you. Make room for those behind you. I know this is your heart's cry. I know this is your desire. You're tired of the fighting. You're tired of the discord. You're tired of the addictions. You're tired of the, of the sin. You're tired of the, the things that are eating you alive. I've prayed prayers like, Lord, please don't let this person waste another day on this world. Don't let them waste another day on, on what the world calls good. But rather, may they know life and life more abundantly. Amen. I know that's your prayer. I know these are the things you're saying at night when you go to bed. You're thinking, Lord, I'm tired of it. I want to see victory come. I want to see my family saved. I want to see my relatives know what it likes, know what it, what it means to live like heaven in freedom. Amen? And if you're with a family member, take them by the hand. If you're not, maybe lay hands on someone next to you a friend, but I want you to pray heaven on their home today. You don't know the details of their life altogether unless you're just that close, good friends, but, and you don't have to know. That, that's not, only God, only God needs to know that, but I want you to declare heaven on their home. I want you to say, Lord, we draw a line, a parameter that this place is heaven on earth that this family is walking according to the citizenship of heaven, that this family knows freedom and joy and victory that comes when heaven is manifested in their homes. 
in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray right now as a decree, kingdom of God, come. Kingdom of God, come. Come to Zeal Church in your fullness. Presence of God. Lord, may your presence, may you, dear God, be manifested in your fullness in this place, Zeal Church, Hermison, Oregon. Dear God, we want nothing less than complete victories. Nothing less than heaven on earth. And we also say this, Lord. Lord, heaven, come to my house. Come to my family. Come to my dinner table. Come to my bedroom. Come to my kitchen. Come to my living room. Come to every space that I share. Come into this place. I dedicate my family I dedicate my marriage. I dedicate my children. I set a parameter. Hell cannot prevail against it in Jesus' name. As Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. It will not prevail upon a house and a people that are standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. Standing on the word, the promises of your word. And so God, we declare kingdom of God, come. Come to our house even now in Jesus' name. Come to our workplaces, Lord. Everywhere I go, when I go to work tomorrow, may the, pre- may the manifested presence of God flood that place. May people turn their heads wondering who just walked in the room. May people turn their heads wondering why did the atmosphere change? Something moved. Something's different. The word says that even the demons in hell are, they they tremble in fear at the presence of God. And so, Lord, I pray for where we go that we are driving out the enemy. We're expanding the kingdom of God. We're seeing people getting saved, healed, delivered, set free. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, we receive your commission. We receive the great commission to go and to do all that you've commanded us, all that heaven represents in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give him praise today. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord.